First, I want to start by thanking Jordan for the facilitating my ability to share this research with millions of boys who have, as a result, felt less alone because they knew that they weren't just alone. So thank you. Um, ironically, my focus on boys' and men's issues started with my focus on women's issues. Um, I served on the board of the National Organization for Women in, 19, in the early 70s. They asked me to form men's groups and boys' groups, and as a result, that exposed me to men's issues, boys' issues, and my own issues. We'll look at the evidence for the boy crisis, the causes of it, and solutions. First, the evidence that I discovered when I did a decade of research for the Boy Crisis book, for example, suicide. When boys and girls are nine, it's equal. Between 10 and 14, it's twice as likely. Boys between 15 and 19 commit suicide four times as often, there we go. And boys between 20 and 24 commit suicide five times as often as girls. In the UK, in one year, there were more deaths by suicide than in all wars since 1945 put together. There's a 700 percent increase in prison population since 1972. Prisons are basically centers for dad-deprived boys. In just nine, 90 years, the female to male life expectancy gap has grown more than 400 percent. Since the 1980s, American men have literally been losing their testosterone, with average levels declining by about 1 percent per year, along with declining sperm counts. Of course, this affects not just male fertility, but also the health of female children. When one sex loses, both sexes lose. The UN finds that boy The UN finds that boys have fallen behind girls in every one of the largest 70 developed nations, especially in reading and writing. By age 21, boys average 14,000 hours of gaming. It only takes about a third of that time to get a bachelor's degree. Men's bachelor's, percentage of bachelor's degrees have declined from 57% to 42% in the past 50 years. The implications for the future of families is when women are ready to have children, female college graduates are not looking for male college dropouts, or as women say, just one more mouth to feed, or marrying down. There are a lot of causes of the boy crisis, but more than any other, I found that the boy crisis resides where dads do not reside. So the question is, why has the family fallen apart, and why have dads fallen out? As citizens of developed nations were able to survive, they wanted freedom. First, the freedom to be able to divorce. And children of divorce are often dad-deprived. They also wanted, moms wanted options. So moms developed three options, to work full-time, to have children full-time, to do some combination of both. Of course, dad, dads have three options, too. They can work full-time, uh, work full-time, or uh, work full-time. Um, each year, 41% of mothers have children without being married. I don't want to make two caveats here. The few people work harder and are more overwhelmed than single moms. And when, and many boys raised by single moms do well. Clinton, Obama, Australia's current prime minister, Anthony Albanese, all were raised by single moms. However, the majority of children of single moms experience some level of dad deprivation. So the question is, that means deprivation of what? Of postponed gratification? of empathy, social skills, motivation, and identity, but also an increase in depression, suicide, 
and addiction to porn, alcohol, drugs, video games. Dad-deprived boys are boys who hurt, and dad-deprived boys hurt us. They are much more likely to commit crimes. They're much more likely to deal drugs, bully, and mass shootings, especially in schools, are almost always by dad-deprived boys. Boys who hurt us are boys who hurt. Anger is vulnerability's mask. So let's move to solutions. If the children who are dad-deprived are part of the problem, the children who are dad-enriched are part of the solution. But the question then is why? What is there about dads and dad-style parenting that enriches children? First is boundary enforcement versus boundary setting. Moms do set earlier bedtimes, but kids under dad's supervision get to bed earlier. The difference? Dad's boundary enforcement. One result, postponed gratification. P postponed gratification is the single biggest predictor of success or failure. When children can't postpone gratification, they can't achieve, they end up disrespecting themselves, and they are rejected by others. Sir, please. Pull over the car. Pull it over now. Pull over the car. I'm not going to ask you again. Dad-style parenting like roughhousing and the teasing that you just saw here also build bonds between dads and children. So let's, take it, let's do an anatomy of roughhousing, for example, and how roughhousing, boundary enforcement, and this bond building create um, empathy, postponed gratification, and social skills. The unconscious dynamics of roughhousing is that roughhousing is like a tree. It creates a bond, and kids obey because they want the treat, just like doggies obey because they want the treat. As they do this roughhousing with boundary enforcement, once the kids know that they will, um, that they will stop the roughhousing, the roughhousing will be stopped. If it gets too rough, the kids have to be sensitive to what might hurt their siblings. This plants the seed of empathy. Instead of the immediate gratification of, of winning, um, the, um, of winning by being aggressive, the children have to learn postponed gratification of being assertive versus aggressive, um, and the assertiveness allows them to bring uh, to develop social skills. Uh, and the children who are assertive develop more friends, but and less aggressive develop more friends, less isolation and depression. These children are not not dad deprived; they're dad enriched. The results. Dad-enriched children uh, tend to be warmer, more mature, more independent, more empathetic, and have a higher degree of self-esteem. So the question then becomes, how do we implement this? If there has to be a divorce, there must be, I have found in my research, four must-dos. There must be equal shared parenting. Parents must live in uh, a maximum of 20 minutes drive time from each other. No bad mouthing that the children can overhear or detect. And there needs to be constant couples communication counseling of at least once a month. To, um, what can ARC do? One of the things I believe we can do is do what they did in Florida, which is to align dad and rich parenting with the goals of all political parties to the degree that in Florida, um, by learning about the importance of dad involvement and what dads need to, to become involved, both political parties passed two out of three bills unanimously, which in this culture is just about unheard of. When men are told they are needed, um, they are willing to die so others might live. Today, we need fewer men, fortunately, to kill and be killed. We need more men to love and be loved. Children need a dad's time more than they need a dad's dime. We need to revive vocational education. Dads, dad-deprived boys do much worse academically. 
but they do respond well to vocational education, which gives them a sense of achievement and purpose and therefore respect. In Japan, 99.5% of vocational education graduates are, um, get jobs. We need to introduce boys to the caring professions and prepare for them like we prepared women for the STEM professions. Of 23 communication skills that I teach, the most important is how to overcome the Achilles heel of all human beings, our inability to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. I think ARC could make a great deal of um, improvement in the world if we encourage this type of training for both elementary school students and their parents. It is the most important, vital, single step we can take toward reviving both our family and our democracy. We need to apply this to checks and balance parenting. <laughs> Ah, oh, sad but true. <laughs> uh, in conclusion, we, need, we don't need a women's movement blaming men, nor a men's movement blaming women. We need a gender liberation movement freeing both sexes from the rigid roles of the past to more flexible roles, responsibilities, and freedoms for our future. For boys and men, that starts with Redefining power, thank you. With redefining power, real power is not about being a human doing, it's about being a human being. A man who joined one of my men's groups shared with me that the success of his business had led to his failure as a dad and as a husband, that he felt the business he owned actually owned him. But the men's group helped him, helped him create his own picture. For him, his picture was wanting to give up his business for just five years to raise his son that he had neglected to raise when he, in his first marriage and his first son. He told me it was the best decision of his life, in, in essence, to balance being a human doing with being a human being. That man, was John Lennon. Men define it, redefining the meaning of power is our best gift not only to ourselves, but also to our sons and to our daughters who love them. We are all in the same family boat. When only one sex wins, both sexes lose. Thank you. <laughs>